So today's topic is International Maritime Solid Bulk Cargo, that is IMSBC code. So we will uh, look at uh, various features of this, how to use it and all. All right, uh, let's go on, get on with uh, today's class on International uh, Maritime uh, uh, IMSBC code, that is. The target audience are all the seafarers, both across nautical and the engineering department. Uh, safety is, is common for both uh, departments. And who are sailing or would be sailing in, uh, on a bulk carrier, some carrying dangerous cargo in bulk, specifically. At the conclusion of this module, the participant will be able to understand the objective and application of IMSBC code, the classification of cargoes as per IMSBC code, the layout of IMSBC code, that is the booklet, how what information can be obtained from where, and the actual carriage of uh, IMSBC code as to what are the various procedures, what are the various practices we follow when we carry IMSBC code. And towards the end is a summary of all that we, what we covered in the past one hour. All right, so let's get on with this IMSBC code. So this IMSBC code is coming as an offshoot of SOLAS. And uh, specifically in Chapter 6, which talks about carriage of solid bulk cargo. And uh, the, these provisions are, I mean, uh, the SOLAS Chapter 6 tells that IMSBC code is mandatory, compulsory. And the application is, I mean, it applies to all the ships to which the SOLAS convention applies and carry solid bulk cargo. But just a kind of reminder, this does not apply to grain, uh, the, the ships carrying grain in bulk. Because there's another code called grain code which applies to them specifically. So these are uh, any solid bulk cargo uh, ships, but not for the grain carriers. Uh, the grain carriers, we have a separate code called grain code. Now, what are the objectives of a code? I mean, uh, for this particular book called IMSBC. So let's look at that. Of course, the safety is always uh, paramount uh, in all these codes to facilitate the safe storage and shipment of solid bulk cargo. For providing information of the dangers, uh, dangers associated with the shipment of certain types of solid bulk cargoes, that is to highlight, to kind of like inform as to what all the various hazards uh, which are prevalent. And it also gives us uh, instructions on the procedures to be adopted uh, when shipping these solid bulk cargoes uh, specifically. So that is the main objective, that is, of course, to improve the safety and plus giving all these information. Now, uh, Earlier, before IMSBC, we had another book called BC Code. IMSBC Code replaces a BC Code. And in the meantime, I mean, in the, during this replacement, uh, SOLAS was amended uh, as required to make the IMSBC Code mandatory for all the ships carrying uh, solid bulk cargo. Uh, IMSBC Code was adopted on, uh, in 2008. It came into force in uh, 2011, that is January 1st, 2011. And uh, every two years, it has got a revision. We will look at the revision part of it a little later. But this particular uh, edition, the, the latest edition, what we have, what you see on the screen, is the, is the latest edition of the IMSBC code. And uh, it incorporates the latest amendment, what is there in force. And uh, it's, it's implemented voluntary basis from January 1st, 2020. And it com becomes compulsory on January 1st, 2021. If you remember, in the, IM uh, the IMDG code also, we had something similar like this on a voluntary basis for one year and then compulsory the next year, something similar to this also. Now, the, uh, let's look at the update cycle of IMSBC code. Very similar to IMDG code, I, the IMSBC code also will be reviewed every two years. That is, all the information is obtained from all the, all the shippers and all, these, all the parties who are, uh, who, are, who are concerning the safe carriage of cargo. Any accidents which happen also will be reviewed and then they will make the necessary changes. The changes are done once in two years and the new, uh, this, this two years is so that the products, if you have any latest amendments, if you have any changes to be done, that can be incorporated into the books easily. And uh, uh, it also makes, to, I mean, uh, due to this two years uh, uh, update cycle, it also helps in, in uh, putting the latest references of SOLAS. So in case SOLAS is also amended, the latest amendments of SOLAS also is incorporated into this IMS. And it's, it's, uh, the IMSBC code has got some schedules. We look into that uh, when we go into this IMSBC code, the details of it. The schedule talks about all the various cargoes, the dangers associated with it, the hazards associated with it. So they're also, they're also updated on a, on a, on a two-yearly basis. So we have this IMSBC code in 2012, which is followed by 2014 IMSBC code, 2016, 2018, and the latest one is 2020. So every two years it is amended, and the latest, uh, the, the one which you see on the right, uh, right hand side is the latest one. All right. Um, now we come into the, the classification of IMSBC cargo. So far, what we have seen is just the basics of it, what is the objectives, why we do it, and all. 
now we come into the uh, into the into the depths of IMSPC code. IMSPC code categorizes a cargo into three groups based again based on the hazards. If you remember, even the IMDG code also did the same classification based on the hazards. So here also we have the same classification based on their hazards. Here we have uh, the classification is done as group A, that is letter A, group B, and group C. So we look into the details of this group A, B, and C. Group A talks about, I mean, is, is about those cargoes which may liquefy if shipped at a moisture content exceeding the transportable moisture limit. We will look into this a little bit uh, later as we talk about more, uh, talk more in detail about this uh, moisture content and transportable moisture limit. But the group A cargo is basically the cargoes which may liquefy. That is the, the cargoes because of, uh, uh, because of uh, vibration, because of settling. The cargo settles down and all the moisture comes up, uh, rises up on the top and the cargo starts li uh, liquefying. Group B talks about the cargoes which possess chemical hazards. Chemical hazards, in the sense, they have, uh, they release some toxic gases, they release some uh, dangerous gases, uh, flammable gases, and which again leads to uh, uh, like fire or some contingencies on board. So those, all those, all those cargoes are grouped together and, and are called Group B. We also have one more group called Group C, which is all the other cargoes, all the other dangerous cargoes, solid bulk cargoes, which are neither Group A nor Group B. So it is, it is, it is uh, classified in, in Group A, Group B, and Group C. Group A cargoes may liquefy, again, given a particular condition, if shipped at moisture content exceeding the TML. Group B cargoes are those cargoes which uh, possess chemical hazards and that could uh, rise to, I mean, give rise to dangers on board. And Group C cargoes, which is neither Group A nor Group B. So we will look into more details as to what all these uh, various kinds of cargoes what we are talking about. The first thing is Group A cargo. Like we said earlier, uh, the Group A cargoes are cargoes which may liquefy if shipped at a moisture content. So now there are some key terms what to use over here. Now, not all the Group A cargoes were liquefied all times. The liquefaction will only happen if it is shipped at a moisture content. Now, every cargo will have its own inherent moisture content. That is a amount of moisture what the cargo has in itself. Now, if there is something also called as transportable moisture limit and uh, also called as uh, uh, the flow, uh, flow limit. That means the cargo starts, I mean, it's, it's already liquefied. So if you if we carry a cargo which is which is more than the transportable moisture limit, the moisture content is more than the transportable moisture limit, then we uh, we have a risk of uh, liquefaction. And these are these cargos. These main examples of these cargos we can uh, we can term it as mineral concentrates. This contains all the refined ores, uh, nickel ore, coal, etc. Now let's look at this liquefaction. How it really happens. Now these uh, yellow, the orange color ones are the, uh, the ore particles and these are the, the blue ones are the small, small moisture which is trapped inside the ore. Because of compaction, because of uh, uh, when the ship is running or because of the, the ship is like uh, rolling and pitching, continuously we have this uh, thumping effect which causes this compaction. Compaction settles the cargo, settles down, I mean the whole cargo kind of tends to get settled. And if you see the difference over here, what happens after compaction, we have water molecule all around this ore particle. That means here over here, the ore particles were all uh, sticking to one another that was adding to the friction and that is why there was no shifting of cargo. Now here what happens is because of the compaction, because of this water which is, uh, which is, uh, which is forming up, which is uh, tending to get uh, loosened out from all these places, they form a thin layer, thin film of around these ore particles. And that is where the ore particles can slip over one another and that is why it increases the, I mean, it decreases the friction and that's why we have something called as a flow state. That means the cargo will start flowing. It's a simple example. This, this particular example done on an on a experiment basis. They have filled up a, uh, a container with, a, uh, with, some, uh, with some ore. And if you look at the, uh, the ore, it is it's quite dry. I mean, uh, looking at it, you will not even, even come to know that uh, there, is, there is so much of water inside. And this is the initial parcel, the initial section. And then after five seconds, it is continuously kept on uh, like a, like a uh, can test kind of a thing. It is it kept on, the, the compaction is going on. And slowly, if you see, the cargo level starts uh, evening out. And we also have, we also see the water is coming up slowly on, on the top. The top becomes slushy. All the water which was trapped in between these ore particles slowly starts rising up. And if you see after one hour of this compaction, all the water molecule has come on top. All the water that is whatever there was water in the, in the cargo in the old has all come on top 
and then now we have something called liquefaction liquefaction is a huge major 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 uh, hazard on board because the cargo starts uh, shifting from one side to the other side it leads to uh, damage to bulkhead it leads to uh, loss of stability and a lot of other uh, associated risks so that's a big hazard the second hazard what we have is what is called as a chemical hazard now we loading some uh, some solid bulk cargoes on board and if you don't take care of it i mean if if the, if the hazards are not uh, taken care of then we have a huge problem on in hand and if a case like this happens like a huge explosion or because of uh, inherent properties of the cargo then we have a a, a, a huge danger uh, danger situation on our ship there are some cargoes which are uh, which are uh, hazardous only in bulk now if you remember the imdg cargo talks about the dangers presented in the package form but now here we talking about another kind of another uh, section of uh, cargo which are hazardous only in bulk the imdg code refer to all the cargoes which are done in, which are dangerous in package format now we are, we are talking about dangerous goods only in bulk that means if you carry a small portion of those cargoes they are quite harmless whereas if they are transported in a in bulk in a large quantities on board cargo ships the ship sells they present a significant risk and requires special precautions from our side so the dangers what are presented by these group b cargoes are combustible solids that is the solids which are which are like uh, which are which spontaneously combust and they are uh, and they are, they can also release sufficient amount of heat the heat causes more combustion the solids that evolve flammable gas when wet wet in the sense if the sea water comes in contact because of the hatch cover not being very uh, uh, weather tight and all that stuff or that uh, those conditions it may evolve flammable gases and the flammable gases will lead to fire there are some solids uh, solid bulk cargoes which can evolve toxic gases when wet also again same thing the uh, because of leakage because of ballast tanks uh, because the bulk is not being uh, uh, the not the full integrity or the, the sounding pipes through the whole cargo holds if the water comes inside then it it may evolve either flammable gases when wet or toxic gases when wet we also have some solid car solid bulk cargoes which are toxic in itself that means the fumes emitted by it uh, are toxic to human body and some of them are also corrosive corrosive to the human body for us corrosive for the steel structure also the the tank i mean the the cargo hold atmosphere also these were the cargo group a and b in the last we also have one more group called group c group c is any other cargo which is neither group a nor group b can somebody tell me now what was group a group a cargo the cargo which liquefies the cargo which, which may liquefy all right so that is group a cargo group b cargo flame holes yeah no uh, we just say chemical hazards i mean uh, they got some chemical properties because of which they hazard risk so group c cargo has got neither group a nor group b that means they are neither liquefiable nor uh, they don't uh, process i mean they don't have any chemical hazards also but they can still be some uh, some dangers associated with it these dangers are are uh, sand and fine particles that is the dust which is which is emitted when we are loading or discharging this cargo and the dust itself is is dangerous for us and it's also uh, uh, in the long run it is also not good uh, for us to uh, to face such uh, conditions the group c cargo uh, another example of that is also aeration leading to cargo shift now a very classical example for this is cement cargo cement cargoes are are very very fine powder and when we are loading a lot of air is also tapped into it and because of which the cement starts flowing from one side to the other side now cement does not have any water at all but still they are liquefiable because because of aeration and the last again the most biggest problem on board the ships is the high density ore because of high density ores you can see a lot of damage has been done on those uh, on the tank top where uh, 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 like because of sagging because of where, where the, uh, the structure itself has got deformed because of continuous loading and continuous uh, carrying of high density ores so these are some of the examples of group c some of the examples of cargoes which uh, uh, which display group c uh, hazard so any doubts in this group a group b and group c because this is where we have to we have classified the cargoes as per risk and based on this classification we are going to take those mitigation steps to uh, take some action any doubts in these what we covered so far moderator here captain anand sir there were yes, no sir. questions in chats okay great all right so let's let's go on with it. if you have any further questions you can ask me towards the end the last 5 uh, 10 minutes so when we take this question 
All right, now let's come to the layout of the IMSDC code. Layout in the sense like how the books is 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 is, uh, is formed and which chapters comes in where. So we'll we'll just talk about it. IMSDC code, like exactly like IM, uh, IMDG code, also contains a main code and some supplements. So main code is what we are going to be studying about it, and also some details about some supplements. And all of this is comprising that single booklet, a single book which is an IMSBC code. So let's look at in the in the first uh, uh, thing. Let's look at what does IMSBC code cover. It has got a, a a long list of chapters, section one to section uh, thirteen. Section one to section ten is mandatory provisions. That is the information on on various cargoes. That is general loading. How how do you go about loading? How what are the various precautions to be taken? So these are all uh, a lot of uh, like material for learning, lot of materials for for understanding. And the best option I would I would suggest is when you are going on a long sailing, when you have this time free time on uh, on board, please open up these IMSBC code and just go through the whole chapters. Now when you when uh, like like we said earlier, IMSBC code uh, uh, is amended every two years. But during the amendments, we don't normally change the whole section of the book. The section the section remains the same. That means the information contained in these sections more or less remain the same. Or What is there in section one is general provision always remains a general provision even after two three years of IMDG code, IMSBC code. So please go through this. At least you'll come to know what information is where. And in case of emergency, in case of any uh, uh, any uh, uh, contingency on board, you know exactly where to refer to. That time, if you look at the IMSBC code and try to figure out some information given over there, it is impossible. We don't have time and we don't have that much of uh, uh, effort also to to literally literally go into all these. So section one and section uh, section one to section ten is mandatory, mandatory provisions for carriage of uh, solid bulk cargo. It talks about loading, carriage, unloading precautions, safety of personnel and the ship, and also details of cargoes that may liquefy. Now this is where it is important. So tomorrow, let us say you become a senior officer and then you are you are told to carry such and such cargo. At least we know that yes, somewhere a long time back I have read that in IMSBC code these cargoes may liquefy. So we will take more precautions. So we will uh, refer to the code. And to get more information, followed by section eleven and section thirteen. Section eleven to section thirteen, which is recommendatory. Section eleven to section thirteen is is kind of recommendatory because it talks about security, talks about storage factor conversion tables, and if you have some other better information elsewhere, we can of course refer to those uh, those information. It also has got a list of references. References is like uh, related to information and recommendations, which is good to follow, not mandatory, but okay, it improves the safety on board. It also has got uh, appendixes. Appendix appendix one is the most important appendix. It talks about individual schedules of solid bulk cargo. Schedules means the properties. That means what we are going to do and look into it is a little later is the schedules as to what all properties are are given in this IMSBC code and how we can use them. Appendix two to appendix four contains a lot of other information like properties of solid bulk cargo. There is just general what are the various uh, properties? Uh, why are they dangerous? It also contains index and also contains the bulk cargo shipping names in three languages. Again, this appendix is appendix that we will see a little later in detail as to what it is. Now, as we talked about in the previous section over here, the annex one, annex one is the most important thing. It talks about individual schedules of solid bulk cargo. So let's look into detail as to what is this information, what is present over here, what what kind of information is is coming up over here. This is the sample page of annex one. Individual schedule of uh, solid bulk cargoes, and let us see what all information is all hidden over here inside. The first one is description. If you, if you can read over here, description and the characteristics. The description talks about general properties of that particular cargo. I mean, what you can. Uh, it's like in in in, in uh, three or five uh, five lines. They're explaining us what kind of cargo is it. Is it in pellet form? Is it in powder form? Is it in uh, what color? And all that stuff, and just giving the just general, very very brief details of of this information. It's followed by characteristics. Characteristic is something which is in detail, which we need to look at. So here is a is a is a magnified version of the same uh, description and characteristic. And this is for a nickel ore. Nickel ore is the most dangerous uh, cargo. It's it's a uh, uh, let's look at the properties and figure out what all what all cargoes what all dangers it represents. Okay, so now nickel ore. Nickel ore. It varies in colors. That means it can be various shades of brown or blackish or grayish and all. There are several types of the ore available, uh, particle sizes and moisture content. That means it is giving in, in in the beginning itself. It is telling 
you have a lot of options of carrying this nickel ore a lot of colors lot of varieties of it so some may contain clay like ores and for concentrates we have to look at nickel concentrate so in just in just brief just it tells us about the details of this particular uh, cargo next when we come down to the characteristics here it's, it, it gives us a lot of information the size size means the pallet size it could be size given in mm it could be given in centimeter it just tells us approximately what size of cargo uh, you can uh, you can expect now angle of repose angle of repose is the angle formed by the bulk cargo uh, against the horizontal that means it forms a small heap any cargo and that heap angle if you take from the horizontal to the one of the edges of that heap that is what is called angle of repose so the angle of repose again given over here the bulk density the next comes the bulk density the bulk density is 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 given in a in a large uh, like kind of uh, range 1400 to 1800 kg per cubic that means the iron or the nickel ore what we're talking about over here can come in a, a wide range of densities uh the inverse of density is stowage factor that means uh, kg per cubic and then meter cube per ton so whatever we have over here that's uh, it's inverse and stowage factor that tells us approximately how much uh, uh, like one ton what will be one, the volume of one ton next we come to the hazard classification like what are the dangers associated with it so it talks about class why it is talking about class is because there are some cargoes which we talked about uh, group b cargo group b cargoes are are dangerous cargoes carried in bulk so group b cargo will have some reference to imdg code and that is what is a class what comes up over here so when we talk about uh, group b cargo you will have some details coming up over here for class subsidiary hazard just like imdg code if this cargo has got any other hazards any other like associated hazards that also show, shows up in this uh, in the subsidiary hazard mhb stands for material hazard risk only in bulk now in this particular nickel ore it does not apply so it is not a material hazard risk only in bulk and uh, that is the reason why uh, we don't even have the class for this cargo also and the last one is group which is mentioned over here as group a now what is the meaning of group a may liquefy may liquefy if transported if the moisture content is more than the tml so this is a major hazard for nickel ore and so that's why this, uh, the whole thing comes about over here as to the day this is of the various characteristics now for every single cargo every single bulk cargo uh, unique bulk cargo we have this details posted in the imdg uh, imsbc code in the nx1 of Uh, that is an individual schedule of a uh, solid bulk cargo is it clear yes sir yeah okay so again uh, we go back to this uh, the same uh, layout and then we also have the next topic comes up is the hazard for this particular iron ore pallets uh, there is no special hazard and the cargo is non combustible it has uh, low risk fire so when you actually produce this uh, iron ore we got we'll get a lot of details about that particular cargo next when we come to storage and segregation if at all any special requirements are there for storage and segregation they will mention it over here and telling what are the various requirements this storage and segregation probably will come into this imdg imdg uh, group b cargoes where you can't store two uh, two dangerous goods together same conditions as what uh, applies for imdg applies for imd i uh, sbc also so if you are carrying multiple cargoes of uh, i am uh, this group b cargoes then there could be some time where there could be some chances where you don't carry two grades of cargo together and that is where the storage and segregation information comes the next one comes is hold cleanliness is there any special specific requirement for hold cleanliness i mean do you have to do some special test or do you have to uh, prepare the hold in a very special manner uh, most of the group a cargoes normally they they are very very specific about water content because group a cargo as it is is liquefiable So even if you have small small pools of water in the cargo hold, they may liquefy. The moisture content of the cargo will increase. So those those group A cargo specifically would mention uh, in the hold cleanliness. They will be mentioned the hold should be completely dry. There should not be any any uh, like kind of moisture in hold. Then we also have weather precautions. Weather precautions in the sense, uh, what how do you handle the the rains? How do you handle all these uh, like uh, climatic conditions and all? so if you some cargoes even if it rains you can keep it open there is no chance there is no problem there is no problem of liquefaction but as group a cargo we only open up the cargo holds which are actually doing uh, doing cargo operations as soon as we finish of the cargo operations we close it rain or no rain so that is what it tells us as to what all the precautions to be taken the next one is loading during loading what are the various what are the various problems what can come up 
uh, based on the experiences of various uh, seafarers earlier. That's what comes up in the loading. In precautions, they talk about various precautions to be taken. Some some key points what are to be uh, to be done. Then it follows ventilation, car, the carriage of cargo. That is during transit, if any any, any precautions to be taken. During discharging operations, if anything to be done. And towards the end, after we discharge the cargo, if any cleanup operation, whatever cleanup operations are, if at all any is there, that is also discussed about. In the end, uh, this is all about the whole preparation about basically about cargo operations and about about the information. This uh, IMSPC code, the individual schedule, also gives us emergency procedures. Being a, a, a dangerous, I mean, being a, a book of uh, all these dangerous goods and all, there could be some times where we need a special uh, precautions for if any emergency comes in. So, for that, what all what all actions to be taken? So, in this, again, I've taken an example of uh, some other cargo. So, over here, it's a special emergency equipment to be carried. Now, this, if you're going to carry this particular cargo, we have to have all these all these uh, uh, emergency equipments to be uh, carried on board in good condition. Emergency procedures, uh, like when you're going to attack, when you're going to uh, fight this contingency, what all what all uh, what all precautions you will will uh, take? That is, wear protective clothing and uh, take self-contained breathing apparatus and so on. In case of fire, specifically in case of fire, what are the various actions to be taken? Now you can have a lot of uh, options over here. So the right, the most, the best option would come up over here. Now, if it is a class A cargo, that is, if it is class A, the cargo which may liquefy, we normally won't use water because there's only chance of liquefaction. And so, the the best option uh, for that particular cargo would be mentioned over here. So in this particular case, it says use copious amount of water, uh, best applied in the form of spray to avoid disturbing the surface materials and so on and so on and so on. Okay. So here it specifically says exclusion of air or the use of CO2 will not control the fire. So even if you have this such a, such a system on board, this will not help you in fighting the fire. So if you read the emergency procedures, that will tell you exactly how to fight these, these conditions, how to fight these fires. And the last is medical first aid. The medical first aid guide is basically that MCA guide and the medical first aid guide, which is forming a supplement of IM, uh, uh, IMDG code. So we have to refer to the IMDG code supplement for this uh, medical first aid guide. Clear? So, uh, any doubts in this layout of IMSBC code? How the individual schedule is laid out? What are the what all information you can get from various uh, places? Again, very, very practical information over here. And this is what you should actually, uh, even before you carry these cargoes, you should actually go through all these, uh, all these uh, provisions, all these content, and make suitable uh, um, like the contingency plan on board or whatever plans what we have, we have to amend those plans. Is it clear? Yes, sir. Okay. So if I can ask you one question, let us say you have some, you are going to load a particular cargo. Let us say this particular cargo, this particular specific cargo for which emergency procedures we are seeing. Do you think we have to make some changes in the uh, in the fire plan, in the fire contingency? Because normally what happens is in case we have a fire on board, we say, okay, close the hole, completely seal it off so that there is no there is no chance of oxygen going inside and all. But if you see a small line over here, it says exclusion of air or the use of CO2 will not control the fire. The, I've specifically taken this example because there are sometimes what it goes beyond our, uh, uh, like what you call common sense of uh, this is the normal uh, the practice of seamanship. So please read through each, uh, each provisions, each schedule very carefully. And if you have to make some changes, please go ahead and make the changes in your contingency plans. Please inform all the crew members before you load the cargo. At the time of emergency, everybody is going to run, uh, run up and down. And that's not the time to change these uh, things. So before you, uh, before you carry the cargo, please hold a meeting, safety meeting, cargo meeting, whatever you want to call it. Make these changes. Have a drill so that everybody is aware as to what is the right way to carry this stuff. Clear? Any doubts? No doubts in chat, sir. Okay, great. All right. So let's so let's go ahead with uh, the further appendix of uh, the IMSBC code. So appendix one was with, uh, what we discussed in detail. The next important appendix is the, al the alphabetical list of bulk uh, cargo shipping names. Something similar to IMDG, you also have uh, each cargo which has got its own unique name. So we cannot use any other names. If we are going to carry these cargos, we have to use only these uh, these names for our for shipping. And it talks about, it, it's an alphabetical list, and it talks about uh, various cargoes, what groups it uh, it comes into. 
and then there are some places if it is not in those bold letters if it's in small letters that means it is it is uh, referred to some other place that means if you're carrying aluminum hydroxide we have to see alumina hydrate where all the details are mentioned something like that so alumina hydrate comes over here so it's not aluminum hydroxide clear so that is for the index of cargo is the next is appendix 5 that is bulk cargo shipping names in three languages because we may go to a lot of other places lot of other uh, various ports and all what we can call so the same cargo what is it called in french and spanish is mentioned over here so that again there is no confusion imdg code does not have this imdg code has got only in english it does not have in uh, french and spanish whereas the bulk uh, this imsbc code specifically mentioned this in in uh, three uh, different languages the most important one for uh, again for, uh, as far as the appendix is concerned is the contact names and address of designated national competing authorities now let us say you are passing through some uh, some uh, national waters and you have some emergency you have some uh, some dangers you have some something like the cargo is some uh, something wrong has happened on board and then you need some urgent immediate uh, attention or some uh, some action some information so the contact names and addresses of designated national competent authorities is given and uh, in india it is director general of shipping and this uh, mumbai address is given over here and if you actually see the imsbc code we also have all the uh, the branches of uh, uh, mmd that is mumbai Uh, Chennai. Then we have uh, Calcutta, Vizag. All these MMD addresses also is given over here. So you can call up the latest and the nearest one, and then get further information. So again, this contact names and addresses is very important because in case of emergency, you know actually the the closest uh, the the closest uh, place, the country you can call the details and get the uh, get some more information from them. All right. So that is about the appendixes and about uh, various uh, contact details and all what is what is done. So this is the layout of IMSBC code. Now we come to the, the actual usage, the carriage of solid bulk cargo. That means now we have con coming to a condition where we are going to carry some cargo. Now what are the various steps? What goes through in the background, in the, uh, in the high, like uh, beyond the ship also, and that's what we are going to look at. So prior expect accepting any cargo for shipment, the shipper, that is the person who is going to give us this cargo, has to give some information. Now, those informations are given in the form for cargo information for solid bulk cargoes what are the informations to be given again we'll look into in a little more detail the the, de the information what is supposed to be uh, obtained from them is the valid up to date information about the cargo's physical and chemical properties now you can't have it something which is taken 6 months back or maybe it, uh, one year back uh, these uh, the cargo's physical and chemical properties it has to be done just before the ship comes in somewhere in the code it mentions about one week time that's the maximum time what they give for uh, for taking these uh, physical uh, that means it is this, the samples are taken by some uh, some agencies some surveying company they do the, they do processing it and then uh, after after taking out all the information from the lab they come out with this information as to the physical and chemical properties uh, the, the shipper is also supposed to give you the exact information documents uh, documentation that includes the correct name he can't use any other name what we want whatever name is there in that in the imsbc code the same name has to be there and the declaration that the cargo information is correct there's something similar to what we have for imdg code also in, in imdg also we have some similar declaration it's exactly same as this over here so that is what is this uh, form for a uh, cargo information uh, we will come into this cargo information little more in detail uh, in in a couple of slides later so we will look into detail as to what is all mentioned over here now for a ship to carry solid bulk cargo exactly similar to what we had for im uh, imdg cargoes we also have something called document of compliance now the document of compliance please don't uh, confuse that with the document of compliance of ism code we're talking about document of compliance for being in compliance with solas chapter 6 and imsbc code this is issued by flag administration mandatorily but if the flag can't do it the recognized organizations on behalf of flag can also issue this uh, document of compliance document of compliance is basically given to a ship that the ship is is eligible is is fit for carriage of solid bulk cargoes and uh, is issued like in this case over here in this example what i have taken it is uh, uh, in accordance with provisions of imsbc code as adopted by the imo resolutions and it's, it's if you read over here carefully under the authority of the government of so and so this is a, a flag state by the class that is the ro that's how it goes So, what what all the information what is contained in this uh, document of compliance is construction and equipment. That is, the ship is constructed 
an equip. Equip in the sense if the if the IMSBC code requires some special requirements for it, that also is mentioned over here. Some special way of uh, fighting fire fighting requirements, some LSA FFA requirements, it's all mentioned over there. And it also says that the ship is suitable for carriage of certain uh, solid bulk cargoes. Not all the bulk, all the solid bulk cargoes, only specific name, names which are listed in this document of compliance. If the cargo what you're going to carry is not part of document of compliance, I'm sorry, you cannot carry that solid bulk cargo. And uh, this document of compliance has got supplements. So supplement one gives us a, the list of cargoes. Only this list of cargoes can be stored, can be carried on board, and only those cargo holds which are which are uh, which are approved. And the footnotes talk, talks about various uh, the list of equipments and all. What are the, any restrictions to be uh, to be done, and all that stuff uh, it is is talked about. So this is about document of compliance. I'll just stop my screen share now and open up another another page, which is about uh, this document of compliance. You all can see this page now. Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. All right. So this is a sample of a document of compliance. Of a uh, of a bulk carrier which is fit for carriage of solid bulk cargoes. It's I've taken it from some other ship. I've uh, hidden all the names and all. Okay, this is to certify that this whole thing is uh, is coming up as per the class requirements. And if you see here, this is a, is a normal a normal template of a cargo hold uh, diagram is mentioned. And here, if you see, these are the cargoes that a particular ship can carry. Which all holds it can carry is also mentioned over here. Now to take specifically now, ammonium nitrate based fertilizers. It's a C uh, category C group C cargo class is not applicable because it's carried in bulk. So that's why the IMBG class does not apply. It can only be carried in hold number one and four. Now hold number one and four, if you carry, then these are number two and number one and two are the footnotes we have to comply with. If you carry in hold number two and three, we have to comply with this number one footnote. And if it is carried in hold number five, then two, three and uh, one, two and three footnotes are to be carried. So this is how this the whole uh, uh, document of compliance is listed up. So this is all the cargoes what the ship can carry. And now if you come down to the footnotes, this is what uh, the footnote talks about. So one is following electrical equipments and cargo spaces to be isolated. Because in that particular ship, uh, ship it seems there were some electrical equipments in the, inside the cargo hold. So we have to isolate all these cargo holds, uh, these electrical equipments from the cargo holds. Uh, footnote number two was not to be stored adjacent to tanks or DBs or pipes containing fuel oil heated to more than 50 degrees Celsius. So if you see over here, the conditions are listed out. Now, this particular condition does not apply for some other ship which is, does not have this these footnotes. That means, let's say I'm talking about urea. Urea does not have uh, any other footnotes, any other condition. That means we can carry this unrestricted in hole number one to five. So, whatever any special precautions are to be done, these footnotes mention it. And the last one is a list of equipments. What are the equipments to be carried in which all holds? So, fixed gas fire extinguishing system. All the cargo holds are provided with fixed CO2 system. So that's what again the class uh, informs, and it is all checked up in all these surveys, and uh, that's that's taken up. So only the cargoes which are here in this uh, document of compliance can be carried uh, on board uh, on board that particular ship. All right. So that is about the document of compliance. Now we come to this uh, uh, the shipment. I mean uh, the shippers declaration. If you see over here, bulk cargo saw uh, the name, the, the shipping, uh, the, the specific name for that uh, the bulk cargo. The name of the shipper, the details of it, consignees and all are, are, are comes up over here. And it also talks about uh, various other instructions. And when we specifically come to see over here, these are the documents, these are the information what a shipper is supposed to give us. The shipper is telling us which kind of cargo it is. Group A and Group B, that means the cargo has got both the dangers of Group A and B. Or it is only Group A or only Group B and only Group C. The shipper also gives us most importantly the transportable moisture limit for that particular parcel of cargo, not a generic parcel of cargo, that specific parcel of cargo what you're going to lift up on that particular ship. And uh, uh, the, the, the shipper also gives us the moisture content at the shipment. So these informations are coming up on the surveyor and we have to take it up uh, very uh, like uh, the most recent information and uh, the, the, the code also says not more than one week. Again, if the weather has changed within the one week, you have to go for another uh, recertification. No. And here is the most important thing, the declaration. This is basically a shipper's declaration, which uh, I read it over here. I hereby declare that the consignment is fully and accurately described and that the given test results and other specifications are correct to the best of the knowledge. So tomorrow, if a shipper is giving us the wrong information, then he can be penalized. 
the owner uh, uh, the pni club the insurance they all can take the, uh, the, the 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 particular shipper to the court and saying that he has uh, done a, a willful uh, wrong by giving us wrong information so this is the uh, uh, this is the information which is given over there now whenever you get any cargoes for shipment yes sir any any questions yes sir hello yeah sir? go ahead one yeah a moderator here one of the question raised by the participant mr kalayarasan okay as like imdg un number does the cargoes under imsbc have any reference number no imsbc does not have any reference number as uh, what we had for the, uh, in uh, imdg cargo but imsbc also i mean it, it, it talks about a particular this name ionor pallets this is a, a unique name for this so i can't call it uh, like uh, ionor in pallet form or any other way if it is uh, the same cargo then we only use this uh, this name this detail thank so you no sir no numbers as such only the names are, are given over there okay thank you sir one All more right. question raised by participant mr mahendra tiwari uh -huh. could you please share the hazards associated and precautions to be taken while carrying coal and sulfur coal and sulfur okay towards the end i will just talk in, in like uh, in general because i don't think i've got time for cargo specific uh, precautions to be taken but uh, when you go on board a ship you will get this uh, imsbc code you can also have it uh, in a library or wherever you are studying so from there you can get in more details about cargo specific ones now uh, if you have to take up these cargo specific ones uh, we will run short of time so uh, we will talk in general as to what are the precautions to be taken thank you sir yeah, okay all right uh, next when we uh, when we talking about carriage of shipment that is carriage of cargoes there are some things what a uh, sequence of events to be uh, done so first of all what we do is the shipper will give us this information so the shipper the, that is what what we taught in the previous section the, the shipper's declaration so once we know the shipper's declaration this the shipper's declaration will have the, the name of the cargo so please go to the in icpc code go to that particular cargo name and get the all the details from that particular code now it, it uh, this appendix 1 as we uh, discussed earlier it, it talks about all the cargo properties requirements and please always refer to this particular code again come back to this code and come back to this reference page don't blindly trust whatever the shipper has mentioned over there now there could be some times where the cargo uh, shipper has given a name of the cargo which is not an imsbc code now that puts us in a huge trouble because that is something cargo which is not been tried and tested if the cargo was there in imsbc code we can blindly go ahead take all the precautions and load uh, go ahead, go ahead with loading it so when the cargo is not in imsbc code we have to take some special precautions and now this precaution starts up from the shipper's angle the I mean, shipper's side uh, from that uh, from that side so before loading the shipper has to give the details of the characteristics and the properties of the cargo to the competing authority of the port of loading let us for example take a case where the ship has come to let's say chennai or mumbai for loading and i am the shipper the cargo is not in imsbc code so first i have to approach the competent authority of the port of loading that is mumbai or chennai and give them the details of the characteristics and properties of that particular cargo now why we have to give specifically for that is because the information is not available ready hand in imsbc code now based on the information what the shipper gives to the uh, the competent authority on the port of loading they will access the accessibility of the cargo for shipment if they feel that the cargo cannot be shipped it's too dangerous that's it uh, we won't carry that particular cargo and based on the assessment of the competent authority on the load port the those authorities will 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 uh, uh, classify the cargo as either group a or group b and the uh, the class and the competent authority in the load port will set the prim the preliminary conditions to be satisfied that means now instead of the shipper telling us what to do or the imsbc code telling us what to do the competent authority of the load port will tell us it is coming right from the government that is why it becomes more safer it becomes much more uh, reliable now if the group if the if the cargo is group c then because we are going to take little lesser precautions that is why more paperwork has to be done so it has to be authorized by uh, by competent authority of the load port and the con competent authority of the unloading port that is a discharge port that is we both have to be concurrent and information has to be has to be passed on to the flag state of the ship that we are they are going to i mean they are they planning to carry a cargo which is not in the imsbc code and they are going to classify as group c 
because group c has got lesser requirements for uh, for safety regarding uh, precautions and all and that is why imo wants to be 100% sure that we are not diluting the safety of the, the seafarers on board the safety of the ship and the carriage conditions and all and once that is done in both the cases the competent authority the load port has to give a master a certificate that is a declaration stating that the characteristics of the cargo and the required conditions of carriage and handling and same information is also passed on to imo so if a cargo name is not in the imsbc code it is not so easy anymore in the in the older bc code we could carry these cargoes blindly because the cargo does not form a part of bc code now imsbc code has has bitten its teeth that means if i am if the, if the name of the cargo is not there in the imsbc code you cannot blindly carry the cargo we have to do a due diligence we have to do a proper risk assessment and to, uh, to to divide the cargo by a and b and this the shipper or the owner is not doing it it has been done by the competent authority in india the competent authority is dg shipping so a, a dg shipping authority is going to do this uh, assessment and they will divide they will decide whether it is a or b or c if it is a and b then it's all the precautions all the all the preliminary conditions to be satisfied are are taken uh, taken care of if it is group c then it's a tri party agreement between the competent authority the load port discharge port that is up unloading port and the flag state <coughs> sorry and in the end the the competent authority of the load port also will give the information to imo the reason for that is because every two years imsbc code is amended so what all hard work uh, this competent authority in the load port have done they can implement it if they see that the cargo is fast moving that is every port uh, every time uh, every two years this cargo i mean uh, in the last two years this cargo has been transported a lot then they will probably put that name in the imsbc code directly that's the reason for sending it to iim clear yeah. and now we come to the carriage of this so that we taken care of all these uh, documentary things now we come for whole preparation this whole preparation is in general all these uh, uh, like general topics what we discuss about a uh, bilge well strainers all to be clean uh, the bilge lining sounding pipes try out the bilge systems check out all the fittings inside all this uh, whole frames no damages if the cargo is dusty then uh, to, pr to protect all these uh, uh, the deck machineries from uh, from dust the ventilators are in good condition because after we start sailing out we may have to ventilate and all the safety safety equipments on deck also in the cargo hold also are are taken care of So this is a normal, uh, like in general, generic preparations. What we do. The next step, what we do is the chief officer has to prepare a, a planning prior loading. That means he will be sitting on the loading cater and then he will ensuring that the cargo is properly distributed, advocate stability is uh, is taken care of, and, uh, and when we do that, the worst possible condition. If the weather is very very bad, we we calculate. I mean, for the worst possible conditions of uh, uh, stability is is complied with. and uh, all documentation as per ism and also if there is any uh, company procedures are also complied with so that is step 3 for prior loading step 4 is making a loading plan so when we make a loading plan we do it stage by stage we do it every single step all these uh, all these steps are taken care of and all possible details are given so that the duty officer who is going to be making this uh, uh, doing this loading operation can do it more safely and uh, same uh, sfbm uh, curves and all are, are taken for every country every stage and uh, the blue code that is the bulk loading and loading code which also forms a part of the supplement of the imsbc code gives us a beautiful uh, plan as to how to go about load, doing this uh, loading uh, plan and also discharging plan so please you can you can make use of it if your company has got your own paperwork documentation by all means you can follow understood so this is the carriage of uh, the plan any questions so far before we go to the summary no questions in chat sir okay great so this is the summary this is step by step part of how to carry this cargo safely i've taken this from a uh, from a publication called carrying say solid bulk cargo safely it's a combination of lloyds register uk pni club and intercargo they have all combined together and to come up with this this particular uh, uh, like a, a flow chart i would say the first question to be asked is has a shipper delivered all required cargo information if he has not delivered do not load the cargo don't be afraid i mean just inform if you are a chief officer just inform the master master would be taking that much of uh, i mean he will inform the shipper he will inform the owners that sorry we can't load the cargo unless we comply with these these requirements as soon as a shipper has delivered all the required information the next step to be done is as we had discussed earlier also we refer to the imsbc code regarding the cargo uh, properties and the associated hazards 
if you have done that only go to the next step if you not done that don't proceed for loading uh, only after you can uh, only after using the msdc code we can do that the next one is the master and the crew have to have necessary ship data information to prepare the ship for loading that means all the information can you load the ship uh, can you load the cargo carefully can you load it safely all the information should be done prior loading please inspect the cargo spaces and to ensure that the cargo spaces are ready for for that particular uh, cargo now when you look at this uh, the shipper's declaration it also have the declaration of our group to see now based on the group we have to go to the next step as to in the flow chart as to what all steps to follow if the group uh, the, the cargo group is group a the first thing to be done is first check the tml certificate that is transportable moisture limit certificate then look at the moisture content in the cargo itself if the moisture content is lower than tml only then you can go ahead with the cargo if it is higher than the tml please don't load the cargo the cargo spaces are free from liquids that is your hold inspection cargo hold inspection is it clear there is no water at all in the cargo hold the visual monitoring is conducted this visual monitoring is during the cargo operations because the cargo may be stored in, in some other places some other place where uh, it has been raining there is some water ingress into it so it has to be ensured that there is no trace of water coming along with the uh, in the conveyor belt and in the end the trimming is considered that is making it flat so that it doesn't form a nice uh, sharp peak in the center of the cargo hold if it is cargo b cargo b is what chemical hazard that is why stowage and segregation uh, picture comes in atmospheric conditions are suitable again because of chemical hazards applicable dust precaution dust precautions in place because more or less all these ores and all it quite dusty and ventilation meets the requirements of imsbc uh, requirements then again we have to look into the uh, the ship's uh, document of compliance if any electrical compliance can be used inside or not now when we come to uh, this uh, cargo group c you see the precautions are not much and that is the reason why we are not taking so much of precautions we have to be 100% sure about these ones and that is the reason why the cargo if the cargo is not in the listed in the imsbc code and it is classified as group c we have to take all due diligence all due precautions to be taken so if it is group c cargo then uh, is imsbc schedule uh, checked up and the applicable applicable precautions are, are taken up and uh, lastly if it is not listed in imsbc code we just refer to the long list of uh, procedures to be done before we can actually load aboard to it so if any of the the answer is negative to not load the cargo as simple as that just stop loading the cargo don't take a chance so it's just not worth it so once we are complied with all these things we go to the next step that is further on is the cargo categorized as dangerous goods in solid bulk code if it is yes does the master have a, a dangerous cargo manifest dangerous cargo storage plan and identify the locations as per the document of compliance so are you loading in the cargo in the right places where you supposed to load and if it is not categorized as a dangerous goods then has the loading plan been agreed with the uh, with the master and the terminal representative the spray like pre arrival information this informations are passed down and then we can make a uh, a workable loading plan are the instructions to suspend the loading unloading operations if the ship's limits are exceeded or likely to be exceeded if uh, if continued that means in case your stresses are going up your ballast is not uh, coping up with that speed of cargo what all precautions have we taken uh, about uh, stopping the cargo and in the end is monitoring the cargo operations actually if it is going to be raining very soon please shut down i mean shut the holds don't take a chance of allowing the water to come inside so all these precautions to be taken up during the loading uh, when all these uh, flow chart is complied if any of the answer is no please don't go about loading the cargo stop it rectify that particular uh, section and then go ahead with that uh. any questions what we covered so far sir uh, in case of any chemical tank or gas carrier we have something called a certificate of fitness so in case of bulk carrier the certificate of fitness is mended with the document of complaints or is there anything separate no the certificate of fitness is basically only for chemical tankers and all uh, for carrying liquid cargo in in bulk now when we come to the da uh, liquid dangerous cargoes in bulk now when we talk about dangerous cargoes you can carry it either in container ship like in uh, those in package forms or you, you can also carry it in in bulk in the bulk carriers so what we have similar for uh, uh, the certificate of fitness the very same very similar concept is used in the document of compliance two document of compliance are there one is for ism code document of compliance so please don't confuse with that that every ship should have any base even if as a tanker you will have a doc now we are not talking about that document of compliance we talking about document of compliance 
for complying with SOLAS Chapter 6 and IMSDC code. And if it's an IMDG, then it's IMDG code. So uh, that it's something very similar to the Certificate of Fitness. If you're a, ta a chemical tanker, only those cargoes which are listed in the Certificate of Fitness can be carried on board that ship. So very similar. Uh, here also we have the Document of Compliance. And where, what are the document, what are the cargoes, the list of cargoes mentioned, only those cargoes can be carried in these, in this particular this ship. Sir, we do a document of authorization for bulk carriers, for grains, for carrying grains. No, that is document of authorization. That is different. So, we are not talking about grain cargo over here. Like I said, the IMSPC code does not apply for the grain ships. That's why we mentioned right in the beginning itself. So, you have something similar, yes. But uh, DOA, the document of authorization is, is just a document to say that Yes, the ship can safely carry grain. Okay, so that means all the all this uh, like uh, the healing moments and all are being calculated for uh, those those conditions are all met during the construction stage itself. So okay, very similar, but they're not exactly as what is documented from plan. Nothing else. Okay, uh, use some references, uh, please. Uh, when you get some free time, please go ahead and look into all these references. The most important is IMSBC code. When you have free time on board, please refer to it. That may sometimes save your uh, life also. And also various PMI club uh, loss prevention articles were referred to. And uh, yeah, so wish you a safe voyage. These are dangerous ships. And uh, wish you a safe voyage, continued voyage, I would say.